Okay, so let's get started. So I'm very excited um, to have Yeshua Bengio here today. Um, and he's recognized worldwide as one of the leading experts in AI. Um, he's most known for his pioneering work on deep learning, um, earning him the Turing Award, which he shared with Jan LeCun and Jeffrey Hinton. And he's a full professor now in the very cool city of Montreal, uh, where he is the founder and scientific director of Mila, which is a Quebec AI Institute. Um, so he also co-directs the CIFAR Learning in Machines and Brains program as a senior fellow and acts as scientific director of Ivado. So Joshua, I'll go ahead and turn the floor over to you. We've already got your slides here, so let's get started. All right. <clears throat> so today I'll um, try to motivate some of the work we're doing in my group and uh, uh, give a sense of uh, where we're going forward uh, in a research program that's an AI research program to make machine learning systems uh, stronger and closer in their abilities to humans, but in doing so gets us maybe um, uh, some uh, interesting uh, thoughts about consciousness and conscious, conscious processing and the neuroscience of, um, of consciousness. So um, let me get started. Right, so let me start from the um, machine learning perspective here. Uh, one of the big weaknesses of the state of the art in machine learning right now is both our theory and our algorithms are really well suited when the data we use for training and the data on which the system is then uh, used come from the same distribution. But in the real world, that's not how it goes, unfortunately. And um, you know, we develop these AI systems. They, when you test them in the lab using the same kind of data that is used to train them, um, it seems to work really well. And then you might have some bad surprises in the field because things have changed. The uh, demographics is different. Uh, the, the geography is different. Uh, whatever, uh, all kinds of things can change. And, and and in addition, there are other things where we clearly see the systems we have are lacking. So uh, they, don't, they don't have much of a reasoning ability. I mean, they, they kind of can learn to do things that look like reasoning, but don't seem to be using anything like the way humans do it, nor do they um, generalize to new reasoning. So reason on new things, uh, old concepts, new combinations. Um, and that raises all kinds of questions about how knowledge is represented in our brain versus how it is represented in um, the current deep learning systems, which are the state of the art in AI. So this is our starting point. Um, so there is a, a, a keyword we use in machine learning called out of distribution generalization uh, to talk about this challenge. And it, it's a little bit uh, difficult to make sense of that phrase because what, is not, what does it even mean to be able to generalize to a new distribution? Because the new distribution could be anything. And then of course you can't generalize. So if, if you've been trained all your life for some set of tasks and then you are asked to do something completely unrelated, why would you hope to do good, right? But humans manage. Um, and so there is a question of what sort of, um, theoretical framework can we use in order to uh, talk about generalization to new distributions? And I'll talk about causality as the main answer to this. Um, also, by looking at how humans do this uh, when they're faced to really new situations, we can get inspiration to design the next generation of AI. So this is mostly what I'm gonna be talking about, including how they represent knowledge. Um, okay, so, uh, there are uh, a number of threads that maybe seem unrelated, but I'll claim are highly related um, in terms of how current uh, AI systems um, uh, fail compared to humans. 
on, on various dimensions. So um, how many examples you need to learn a new task? It's also called sample complexity. Um, your ability to do well on a new task or a new distribution, a change in distribution. So that's the out of distribution generalization I talked about. Um, how fast uh, your performance improves when you move to a new task. How you're able to discover causal structure in the data that you're observing and how you're able to reason about the causal structure after that. And finally, the question about knowledge representation. Um, uh, humans are able to break down knowledge in small pieces that we can verbalize with words. And uh, when some new piece arrives, we don't need to like change everything usually. We just have sort of new piece of information and we can like easily combine it with old pieces. And, um, and that sort of compositional knowledge representation is not something that is uh, natural to the current style of um, AI systems. Okay, so my claim and uh, the, on what uh, my research program is based is um, that there is a unique cause for all of these gaps um, that we haven't really been able to incorporate uh, the style of computation of processing that is associated with consciousness um, in AI. And there, you know, we, we have made some progress. And I'll mention some things, but um, all of these things I talked about, uh, uh, I'll argue, are related to, are things that humans are good at because we are able to um, attend, think consciously about things. Okay. So, so that's the that's the hypothesis, if you want. And I'll present some evidence uh, from AI research in favor of that, but uh, it's it's like still an open question, of course. First, um, let's let's uh, get maybe some examples of um, how humans face a um, change in distribution, like a new setting. Um, so when you're in the, your usual settings, you don't need to think consciously in order to act. You can do your usual thing, let's say you're driving uh, in your normal route and you can talk to the other person in the car, you can listen to radio. Um, but if something unusual happens, you have to pay attention. Um, so the example I like is, uh, well, maybe there's construction and you have to think about a new path or, um, Another example that's maybe more interesting is um, um, all your life you've been driving, say in North America on the right side of the road, and then you go to London, you rent a car, you have to drive on the left. Almost everything is the same except this one rule that's changed, right? Um, so what happens? Well, so first of all, clearly the way that your brain is gonna be operating in that circumstance is very different. It's not gonna be your habitual uh, driving. You're going to be reminding yourself all the time to stay on the left. Um, you're going to be trying to reason about what it means to be on the left and making sure you don't like hurt pedestrians and, and, and not do an accident. Um, and also something interesting is that this is a temporary uh, experience. After a while, you get used to driving on the left and you're like uh, have a fast learning curve compared to machines. So if, if we had current AI systems in that situation, they might do a lot of accidents. They might need thousands of accidents before they get good at it. And of course we can't afford that when we put, put this, these AIs in, in the world. So we need to understand how humans do that. And clearly they, um, they, they, they use this uh, attention-driven conscious processing that I've been talking about. Okay, so of course, uh, kind of psychologists and, and neuroscientists have been studying uh, this kind of uh, conscious processing for many decades. Um, one book that really helped me get off the ground is uh, Thinking Fast and Slow from Dan Kahneman, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics, um, and who studied uh, some of the uh, biases of uh, human brain and mind. And um, he and others talk about two really kind, two different kinds of systems. Maybe the word system is misleading. 
but if they're two styles of processing because they actually coexist. Um, one is uh, intuitive, fast, it's happening below the radar of consciousness typically. Uh, computation is highly parallel. Um, it, you can't explain verbally what is going on. You don't have access to that information. And that's what we do in our habitual behavior where we don't need to think about it. Um, it relies on knowledge that is implicit because you, you know, you, you, often you can't fully describe it. And a lot of what we do right now in AI based on deep learning is, is of that style. And then we have the sort of conscious processing. So it's uh, much slower in order to do anything. So initially when you were driving in London, um, you don't wanna to go too fast. You, you wanna be very careful, um, but you can think logically. The uh, thoughts come sequentially and uh, you can explain them. You can verbalize them quite easily. This is pretty much how we design uh, and communicate algorithms, for example, how we plan and how we reason, it all relies on, on, on these uh, abilities. Um, where knowledge is more explicit, where we combine concepts, uh, semantic concepts um, on the fly, and that allows us to generalize to new situations. So we've never been in London, driving in London, um, and now you know, we have this new rule, but we know a lot of things about driving, and uh, we can just like throw in this new piece of knowledge and uh, combine it with the things we knew uh, in order to take pretty good decisions, well, compared to machines. So um, one uh, reasonable hypothesis here is that uh, there, there is this implicit knowledge and, and explicit knowledge. And um, there may be a good reason from, from an AI perspective, from a mathematical perspective, there may be a good reason why there is this division. Um, and I'm gonna try to sort of clarify that, but, but really the idea is the kind of knowledge that we can represent explicitly, reason with, uh, consciously and so on, um, obeys certain uh, uh, structure, um, certain preferences, uh, what we call inductive biases in machine learning, which the other more implicit knowledge uh, does not obey. And so it would make sense from an evolutionary perspective, if, if that more structured um, uh, type of knowledge uh, brought some computational or learning advantages uh, to separate these two things. Uh, and so a lot of my research has been and continues to be about clarifying what it is that's different between the explicit knowledge and, and the implicit knowledge so that we can design new types of neural nets that can accommodate both. Okay, so let's talk about the aspect of uh, knowledge representation. Well, current neural nets, uh, they're like big homogeneous architectures. Well, to some degree, things like transformers are moving in the right direction. But knowledge is not very clearly localized. It's completely distributed. If you look in the brain, we see a lot of specialization. I mean, just cortex for now, which is of course only part of it, but the very important one, uh, we see specialization in terms of uh, what type of content um, in, in a particular you know, millimeter square of cortex, uh, you'll see um, neurons generally responding um, to just a few uh, types of things. So why would that be useful to have that kind of specialization? Um, essentially, if we can break down knowledge into pieces that can be recombined, composed for dealing with new situations, this can be very powerful in the setting of transfer learning. In other words, when um, we, we are facing a new task and we can exploit what we've learned before. And the idea really is simply that this uh, attention system to machinery allows to uh, pick uh, just the right elements, the, the, the right pieces of cortex that contain the relevant, some relevant information, combine those in order to come up with the, those thoughts that uh, uh, essentially are solutions to problems, interpretations of what we're seeing, imagined uh, plans, imagined futures, counterfactuals about you know, how things could have been different in the past. Um, so, so this raises interesting questions for AI researchers like myself, like how do we organize 
the learning and the architecture of these neural nets. So we would have this sort of modularization and factorization of knowledge into the right recomposable pieces. And, and what are the mechanisms maybe inspired by what we know about the theories of conscious processing, like the global workspace theory um, that can enable this kind of on the fly composition and reasoning. Um, a good source of inspiration is natural language. In fact, it contains a lot of useful information about how we think because it's, all, it's you know, partly a reflection of what's going on in our mind uh, at the conscious level. And, and linguists have been studying this quite a bit, of course. Um, and they talk about something called systematicity or machine learning, people call it systematic generalization. Uh, here, I actually have a, a visual example. You take three concepts that you know, you can combine them in such a way that when you see the image in the bottom, you make sense of it. It's a vehicle, you know, it's, a, uh, it, it's not like the ones you know, but uh, clearly you, you, can, you can more or less use it like some of those you know already, some of those properties. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, we're able to do that and we do that all the time with language, even though the new compositions, the new like phrases, sentences uh, or images um, uh, are unlike anything we've seen. It's, it's worse than they're unlike anything we've seen. They might have zero probability of happening. In fact, they might be impossible. For example, you know, I can tell you about a science fiction scenario. And of course it's, you know, maybe it's physically impossible but you can easily imagine it because it combines pieces of knowledge you already know. And when we try to test deep learning systems or any you know, machine learning systems today to um, uh, see how well they would generalize with such out of distribution examples, they don't do that well, which is what I said at the beginning, but there's a literature documenting that. All right, um, there's, there's another related issue that, that I won't spend too much time on, but I think could be interesting for philosophers, which is current machine learning and this current AI is mostly getting its knowledge about the world from, from data, from corpora, from experience, sometimes interactive. Um, but uh, we humans are able to do something a bit different. So we are able to combine the experience, maybe huge you know, life experience with just a single sentence, like, oh, there's this new traffic law. Um, we're able to take instructions. We're able to take natural language descriptions of new pieces of knowledge that can even override things we've seen for all our, our life. And if we were able to build AI systems that could uh, represent knowledge that they get from experience as well as from instructions in the same uh, high level kind of uh, form similar to the way our thoughts are structured, it would be extremely useful because we could do something very similar to what Isaac Asimov you know, proposed in his uh, iRobot series uh, with the, the uh, laws of robotics. And uh, that, that could be uh, extremely useful. Um, okay, so how do we do that? Um, let me uh, go back to the question of uh, generalization to new settings. And because we can take inspiration from a totally different field that is physics. How do physicists model the world? Um, they, they model it with uh, things like laws of physics, let's say Newton's laws, where we, um, we characterize how the world works, like the dynamics of it, how things can change, forces, and so on. And, um, for the same, however, for the same laws of physics, you could get very different distributions of data. So if you live on earth, you see some types of images. If you go to the moon, it's the same laws of physics, but it looks very different. So, you know, what's, what's going on here? We have the same causal mechanisms, but because the conditions are different, uh, initial conditions, if you want, uh, we get very different observed data and What's interesting about humans is that when we make sense of the causal structure, these dynamical systems uh, descriptions, uh, we can do that too. We can generalize, uh, we can go to the moon and, and survive well, <laughs> with some help. Um, 
uh, at least make sense of what we see. Whereas the current way that uh, machine learning is doing its thing uh, is, is relying on this assumption that there's one distribution and we get data from it. But you see in my example with causal uh, laws of physics that there is not one distribution. You, you know, you have the distribution on Earth and you have the distribution on the moon. It depends on these initial conditions. And in general, we're gonna talk about interventions. There's uh, things that can change with the variables um, so that the, the data we get could be very different. Um, and if we understand the, that, that causal structure, then we can do that sort of generalization. So th there's a long history of research in causality uh, and mostly outside of AI, but some, some dating multiple decades like uh, Yuda Pearls, for example, um, but it's still something marginal in, in machine learning. Uh, uh, it's becoming it's becoming like a trend right now, but uh, I think machine learning people are starting to understand better what it is about and how important it may be for this question of out of distribution generalization. Um, and one way to think about it is a causal model is not one distribution; it's a huge family of distributions. And those distributions are related to each other. They, they essentially can be characterized with the same parameters. It's the same laws of physics, but the, uh, they differ because maybe some initial state is different as I said in my example, or somebody did something different. Uh, there are some interventions. You, you, know, you close some door and suddenly a lot of paths are not available and uh, your, your picture of how to drive uh, or to go to a, from A to B might need to be very different. So uh, this is, uh, there's this notion of intervention that's uh, at the heart of what causality is about, which uh, dictates which distribution from that family you're actually talking about. And the reason I'm bringing up causality is because this is one of the things that humans are good at, at least well, they, they also suck at it, but they're better than machines. Um, and uh, in fact, we are obsessed with causality and uh, it would be good to incorporate that into uh, AI systems and humans seem to be doing it using their conscious processing. Okay, so th it's interesting that people who have been thinking about causality also have been thinking about knowledge representation. So these causal mechanisms, um, it's not just like one thing, it's a bunch of little pieces like think of different laws of physics um, or different uh, ways that different types of objects behave if you're like in a video game. And um, there, there is this principle that was proposed by Shopkoff and collaborators about a decade ago of independent causal mechanism that says that um, the, the ideal situation for representing knowledge from a causal perspective is to break it down into independent pieces. So what does it mean independent here? not in the usual statistical sense, because we're talking about knowledge, not about random variables. Um, but one you know, easy to understand uh, analogy is when you write code, you try to break it down into independent pieces, meaning if you have to rewrite, rewrite one piece, you don't need to change the others. That's the ideal way to factorize the code, right? Um, and this is the same thing here. We'd like to have machines that can do that. And humans seem to have that ability. Now, um, the kind of causal structure that humans think about are not in the space of low uh, level uh, sensory measurements. Like we don't, we don't create a mental uh, causal model of how pixels arise and how they are related to each other, but we do have a, a, a kind of mapping in our head that relates the le low level sensory signal like images or video or sounds and also low level actions like motor control uh, to high level concepts. And it, it is these high level concepts that are causally related to each other. And right now we don't have algorithms for jointly discovering the you know, low level to high level relationship as well as discovering the causal structure at the high level. But we're making progress in that direction. Um, it's also highly related to um, reinforcement learning, which is the part of machine learning that's interested in actions and their effects in terms of rewards. And it's also very much influenced by neuroscience. 
um, because these interventions, they can be related to agency. So usually the reason things change in the world, at least the reasons that we come up with in our mind are uh, kind of attributing the change to somebody did something, somebody had an intention to do something. And, and so these, these causal interventions, they actually correspond to uh, intentions, goals, uh, abstract actions. Um, and uh, this, is, this is something that the reinforcement learning community needs to crack. It, we don't know how to do that well, but humans, again, are good at that. Now, I said that uh, there are special properties of these um, the sort of statistical structure um, and type of dependency that exists between those high level abstract variables. That is not generally true of the low level sensory um, signals. And I won't have time to go through all of them, but I'm gonna give you some examples. And maybe the most important one is, um, is the following. It, uh, it, and we can see it in language that these high level variables are related to each other through a very sparse dependency. So very few variables are sufficient to predict another one. Like in this sentence, if I drop the ball, it will fall on the ground. It's, it seems like nothing special, but from a machine learning perspective, this is actually an amazing thing that from just two or three variables, the, you know, I was holding the ball and so on, and then I drop it. Um, I can predict what's going to happen with very high um, confidence and, and success. So that prediction is very accurate. It will fall on the ground. Um, usually in order to make a very accurate prediction in the real world, so at the level of pixels, you can't just rely on two or three other uh, variables. So two or three pixels are not good at predicting another one. You need thousands of them, millions of them. Um, so there's something special about the that sparsity of the dependency structure that exists on the high level. And I, I've written that uh, this may be a um, evolutionary advantage of having a high level of representation. And it might also explain, at least give one possible reason for the bottleneck of working memory. Uh, that's the heart of the global workspace theory from uh, Bernie Bars uh, and then the, its improvements uh, by Stan Deanne and others. Um, so why is it that our thoughts uh, and our conscious attention is limited to so few elements? Well, from a machine learning perspective, if you're only allowed to do your computations at the high level, your inference, looking at very few variables, then the only kind of dependencies you can represent are those that involve very few variables. And so that kind of uh, forces the um, high level representations to be about entities that are um, related to each other in this very simple way. That makes it easier to, uh, to model those dependencies. There are other uh, things we can take home from uh, cognitive science and neuroscience of conscious processing, which uh, can inspire and structure this future wave of, uh, of neural nets that I'm trying to build. Um, so we call these inductive biases. There are sort of constraints or preferences in the architecture and the way we train. So I've already explained the working memory bottleneck, and I've talked a lot about the specialization. So the idea that they're like these reusable pieces of knowledge modules, uh, presumably like millions of them in Cortex that are gonna be dynamically uh, composed. Um, and there, there is this sequential aspect that I mentioned also. Uh, um, and, and, and I mentioned also the, the sort of causal semantics of these high level variables, at least uh, some of them, many of them. Um, so we've done work in the last few years um, to try to test some of these ideas. Um, so one of the papers, uh, actually, it, it is, uh, it's been presented at Europe's 2021, I think, um, is, um, is about a neural net architecture that implement a kind of uh, 
global workspace bottleneck, uh, where different parts of the system um, are forced to communicate through this blackboard, where the characteristic is only one of the module in our in our model, one of the module um, or very few say are um, winning a competition with an attention mechanism to be able to write in in the workspace and and then the content of the workspace is broadcast to all of the modules so they all kind of know what has been that content um, and we find that these kinds of constraints actually lead to better out of distribution generalization at least in sort of uh, simple like uh, game like uh, environments that we study um, and I'm looking at time. So we, we have a number of these papers. Um, oh, actually, it was not NeurIPS, it was iClear, the one I just uh, mentioned. But uh, there, there are a number of these uh, papers um, studying different aspects um, of, of um, how these inductive biases can be put in neural nets. Um, let me uh, kind of shift for the few minutes that are left to looking a little bit more forward into where we're going. And um, so some of the things we haven't done yet, or only very recently, is um, um, take stock of some of other properties of conscious processing in the brain. So um, we can't be completely sure, but there is uh, an apparent uh, randomness or stochasticity in the choices. So if there are multiple interpretations for a scene, for example, your conscious thought will be about one of them, at least at a time. You might you might switch to another one later. So think about the necker cube. You can't, it's not you're gonna have not like you're not gonna have a mixture of half and half. We don't we don't get that. And this this is a property that um, is missing in current neural nets because of the way we train them with uh, uh, end to end training and, and and it's kind of incompatible with the way we currently train them. There, there are potentially solutions, but this is uh, something that has held, held us from uh, doing the right thing. Um, so we take these hard decisions and they're stochastic. And they seem to, not only that, this, the, the, these uh, interpretations or thoughts, they seem to come with a probability that uh, at least in simple settings where we can compute it, matches the Bayesian posterior. In other words, like the right interpretation, maybe there are multiple right interpretations. Maybe one is uh, should be chosen with uh, you know seventy percent of the time, and the other thirty percent. And and people will uh, choose one of them uh, with those proportions. Um, so um, so we've been exploring uh, new uh, neural net architectures and training procedures that that allow to do that, and also to modularize. Um, knowledge in two pieces. Uh, and the latest paper in that is this um, UAI, that's Uncertainty in AI paper that came out just uh, uh, in August uh, called Bayesian Structure Learning with uh, Generative Flow Network. So the, 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 the technology behind it is called uh, G flow nets or Generative Flow Networks. And in, in this paper, we study how we can use this to um, sample from the possible causal graphs, which dictates which variable is the direct causal parent of which variable in, in, in the, uh, as edges, uh, directed edges of a graph. And uh, the Bayesian posterior is, is able to characterize all of the ways we can come up, we could come up with uh, this causal explanation. Uh, but of course, we'll sample only one at a time. Um, um, yeah, so so one way to picture that in your mind uh, and, and connect these architectures with um, the global workspace theory, for, for those of you who know a little bit about it, uh, is a sort of hand hand uh, drawn here. So the, the red things here, you can think of uh, cortical modules, um, and the, the the red edge, the red arcs, uh, it's just like think of like the feed forward path where you know the what they compute could be feeding other modules. And we see that, for example, in the visual cortex. But there's, you also have these green arrows. And these green arrows uh, arise because any of them can send content uh, to working memory. And there is this, uh, this bottleneck, you know, big green circle that uh, makes a selection. There's probably a policy that's uh, consistent with the attention schema theory that uh, um, controls 
uh, you know, which of these modules or which uh, small subset of them is going to be able to write to work in memory. And of course, then that content in blue is going to be broadcast to everyone. Um, content can also come from, um, from epistic memory um, and, and uh, both the current inputs and, and your memory, of course, compete for attention. Um, um, I want to say a few more words again uh, uh, about uh, getting the, the uh, understanding of conscious processing in the brain and some of the interesting aspects that it has. So one of the aspects I didn't talk much about is the discreteness of uh, uh, a lot of these um, concepts that we manipulate consciously, which means it's, uh, it, 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 you know, we can translate them in words. But at the same time, everybody knows that the, that discrete representation it, it seems uh, incomplete as a description of our thoughts. And, uh, you know, uh, quite a bit has been written about the ineffable quality of subjective experience. It's hard to put in words. So, so I have a theory to explain this. It's actually very simple. Um, it, we hold in our brain both um, a discrete representation, like, like words, and a high dimensional continuous representation, like word embeddings that we currently have in deep learning. These are these big vectors that capture the semantics of the word. Now, you don't have access to that big vector. It's, it's the state of your cortex or something like this. Uh, so it's a huge dimensional vector. Um, and how are the two related? Well, there's a lot of evidence that when you become conscious of something, um, uh, what's going on is the dynamics of your brain um, converge to a fixed point. Um, so fixed points are attractors, meaning that um, there are you know, many places to start with that land into uh, one or another attractor. And the attractors are mutually exclusive, which means that typically, especially the fixed points, which means that they, you know, e either in one or the other, and that's a discrete nature. But, but the attractor is also a state of the cortex. And, and that means it's a very high dimensional object representing you know, all the frequency patterns uh, associated with that state. So the two things coexist. In fact, they're the same thing. It's just that uh, we can um, uh, communicate the, the, the discrete aspect of this duality. Um, so we we have one of the papers I listed as, uh, starting to explore the effect of that discreteness in neural nets. And, and again, finding that it seems to help, even though you'd think it hurts because we were throwing, or throwing away information. Um, uh, to have some kind of bottleneck in, in discrete bottleneck in the communication between different parts of the brain. Okay, so the last slide here um, is about a topic that uh, uh, I don't usually talk about, but since you guys are interested in this, uh, let me share my thoughts about subjective experience. Um, so first of all, I'm, you know, um, let's say in, in the camp that's clearly materialist. And uh, I think that scientifically we can't really um, take the nature of subjective experience um, as we feel it, the first person, as a premise, um, rather, uh, we should take all of the information we can gather about it, um, such as what people report or what we can measure in our brain, um, is observations that give us clues about what may be going on in the brain and seek explanatory theories for this. So, so that's my sort of starting point. And we do have a lot of uh, um, knowledge that uh, constrains the, the kind of processing that, that is associated with consciousness, uh, all of the variants of the global workspace theory being those that I, I, I like. Um, I mentioned uh, the uh, sort of dual nature of uh, uh, the state of the brain, both discrete and um, ineffable, uh, hard to express. That may be part of uh, uh, what's going on about this, uh, um, uh, subjective experience that we can't easily communicate. 
but then the, there is of course uh, another aspect which um, uh, Graziano and collaborators have been uh, writing a lot about that has to do with uh, the separation between the policy that controls where you put attention, what you put attention on, and the actual like model of the world that is going on in uh, maybe the rest of the brain or spread out in, in different neurons that um, is is doing the real job. And uh, and so the this the idea here is that the the policy that controls attention needs to uh, to do its job to build a sort of internal model of what the rest of uh, the world model is doing. So it's like a model of the model. And, um, and, and that separation may very well explain this other feeling we have that gives rise to intuitively for, for most of us, there, this uh, feeling of uh, uh, you know, Car Cartesian dualism essentially. Um, and, and, and maybe related to the free will illusion as well. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. And happy to uh, chat and answer your questions. That's wonderful. Um, well, can everybody hear me okay? I thought I'd go ahead and call questions. That was fascinating. Um, and so uh, hopefully I will see hands raised. Um, on the, you know through the mechanism so can people either raise hands or shoot me a note in the text oh okay rachel st Clair, go for it hey okay thank you uh and thank you Joshua, so much for that awesome talk um i read some of your recent papers and kind of been following along and really interested in in the direction you've been going um i guess i just had two questions uh, on your talk here. I wasn't quite clear on um, the slide you had on the independent pieces of, of code and those representations. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have a paper that explains that more. Uh, yes, uh, there's a paper with Anirudh Goyal um, that's going to appear uh, in the Proceedings of Royal Society, but it's already an archive. And, um, and it has the word inductive bias in the title, which should be easy to find. Okay. And, uh, and one of the inductive biases is this principle of independent uh, mechanisms. And, and I can explain in one sentence the, 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 the code analogy. So right now, the way that our uh, artificial neural nets are set up, if we change one piece of knowledge about the world and you know you get some new observations in this modified world uh it, it's you get a big drop in performance and it takes a lot of time to adapt and a plausible explanation is that the, uh, the knowledge hasn't been factored like broken down into the right pieces or maybe not broken down in in any sensible way at all and so you you have to kind of relearn everything but if you had broken knowledge into the right pieces and one of them needs to change for some reason, then it's easy to adapt because you only need to change that part. And when we write code, it's the same thing. I mean, I, I don't know if you write code, but if you write code, mm -hmm. you try very hard to factor the, the job that has to be done into as independent pieces as possible. So that uh, if uh, later you find a bug in one of the, uh modules you don't need to rewrite everything else right right yeah um that's helpful i guess just the term compression in there threw me off oh okay okay well i can explain this is like an information theoretic way of understanding things so let's say you have two pieces of code so it's two pieces of text right you can you can zip them you can compress them either separately or as one big thing and if you get the same length whether you do it separately or together it means there is no information in one of them that's kind of redundant with the other. So this is actually something you can quantify, this independence. It's how many bits of information you know, extra do you win or that you, you save by, by uh, compressing them together rather than separately. Yeah, um, very interesting concept. I, I wonder how that relates to something like hypervectors, which is a symbolic compression, but I, I can... I, I won't take up too much of your time on that stuff. Uh, my other question was kind of, 
Uh, you're talking a lot about system one and, and system two, and I seem to find system two is a very human thing. Maybe I'm wrong on that intuition, but I'm wondering how you think like animal intelligence and consciousness fits in if they're not doing that much system two. And kind of what I'm getting at is like neural networks haven't really shown animal intelligence. And so if we're just missing more of this system two, um, and if animals don't even do that much system two, like, can you just kind yeah. of explain that? Sure, I think it's a plausible way of thinking, and I know you know good colleagues who think this the same way you're expressing. Um, well, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know enough about uh, animal biology um, to know uh, where is the divide, and and I suspect that lots of other animals have uh, some aspects of the system too. It's like it's not like a black and white thing, probably. Um, and uh, my guess is that we just have system too much more developed and with some features that others don't have, but that some, you know, like it's very obvious that uh, um, uh, other mammals and primates, especially, um, and, and um, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, corvids and so on, that they, 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 they seem to be able to do some types of reasoning on the fly. Um, and not as sophisticated as ours. So I don't know, um, but in the work that I'm doing, so now this is, was like the biology thing, which I'm not an expert in, but in, on, the, on the machine learning side, what I can tell you is that one of the big challenges for the original deep learning, as we conceived it in the beginning of the century is, what is it that we should put at the top level of the hierarchy of deep learning? So you have all these layers, but what, what sort of thing should we have at the top? And this has been an unanswered question. So forget about biology. Like we do need to like make sense of what's the right way to represent things at the top. And, and, and I think that something system two like is, is better in some sense because of the reasons I tried to articulate. Um, and it might help the system one, two. I mean, uh, system one, it could be really better if it's, um, if it has these representations that, that become more and more abstract. Now, yeah, so you're gonna have a purely like AI motivation as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It reminds me of some of Ben Gertzel's work with Hyperon and kind of making an integrative thing, but uh, thank you so much for taking my questions. You're welcome. Oh, okay, so Matt McCormick is next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Thanks, yeah. Professor Benji. I really appreciate the talk. Uh, I'm a philosopher at California State University. Um, lots of great stuff in here. Let me just ask a quick, a quick question about some of your references. Would you mind putting that slide up with the four or five papers that you're oh, yeah, yeah, working yeah. Sure. on? Again, and I'm, happy to, and I'm happy to share the slides as well. Right. Oh, great. So I'll, I'll send them. Yeah. Uh, and let there me was... do that. Yeah, let me do that for you, anyways. Uh, very Great. Nice. Yeah. Okay. And there was a reference you made to a paper by maybe a Greg Jano who's working on some. Uh, I, th I thought that was the name, but I wasn't sure. Uh, Inductive biases. Uh, Goyal. So uh, the, the reference I made was, oh, okay. uh, so the, this okay. same author yes. here, Goyal, you can see his name in how that's basically his PhD thesis has been on this subject. And Great. he's graduating uh, next uh, two weeks or something. <laughs> okay, perfect. Okay, so here's my here's my contact question. Yes. And again, forgive me, I'm not a computer scientist, so I'm going to talk about this in philosopher's no terms. Problem. But you mentioned um, attention schema theory in passing, yes. and yes. you're you're trying to think about ways to modularize knowledge and then direct yes. direct attention around yes. the cortex or the neural net. Uh -huh. So I want to see if I can maybe connect some dots here. Um, you didn't say much, and maybe you'd say more about how and if you think the attention schema model or something like it could be harnessed to do the steering of the attention from the sort of executive level. Yeah, that's what it does. And, and okay. then you'd need one, and you'd need one. Right. And OK, so. Um, one question might be, well, what's, um, 
who's doing the steering there or how's the cataloging operating there's at no that level? It's a, it's a policy, it's like in reinforcement right. learning, right? So you would use principles of reinforcement learning and the reward, the kind of reward that I, you know, working on right now for this policy is the number of bits of information that you gain by thinking about something, choosing some variables to think about. Um, and, and if you choose other variables, you would, you would expect to gain a different number of bits of information. Right. Uh, and information about what? Well, you know, it might be about future rewards. It might be about the other things that you haven't yet um, um, uh, brought to your attention. So, so let me really give it like a very simple cartoon example. Let's say you, you see um, a, a, a rich image with lots of details in it. And okay, so I look at the image and I say, oh, there's a cat chasing a squirrel. And then that squirrel is, is climbing on a tree. Okay, so I've chosen these things and I could have chosen many other things. I mean, obviously this is like, this is in nature, lots of things are happening. Maybe uh, leaves are flying and uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a storm coming. I don't know, like lots of things could be happening that I could talk about. And there's all the details, the visual details in addition. But I could talk about it. Oh, it's well, it's funny. Like this, there's this one leaf here which is already brown, whatever. And and so, the interesting question is, um, if I if if this policy chooses to talk about the cat and the squirrel, um, a, how much does it tell you about the rest of the scene? Um, versus if I talk about one pixel again, taking an extreme. In, in the image and say, oh, this pixel on the top right here is blue. Um, obviously you get a lot more out of the talking about the cat and the squirrel, at least from, uh, and there's probably like a value system in there. Like we, we care about agents, right? Um, so so uh, uh, you, can, you can write mathematical formula that, that represent that sort of reward function. And then this policy is just a piece, piece of network that is trained to try to make the, the attention decision, which is like an internal action, such that it gets as much reward as possible. There's no Great. executive here. It's just right. a piece of network that's trained to maximize these rewards. So as the system gets more and more uh, capable of handling more and more diverse problems and has transferable knowledge. Yes. And if I'm understanding you right, then the policy is getting more and more robust and more um, capable of sorting and choosing between different modules yes. in order to yes. solve problems. Yeah. Okay. So one more quick question then. Well, it's a quick question. It's going to be long to answer probably. You mentioned uh, phenomenal or uh, subjective yes. qualitative states, yes. at least in humans, and sort of trying to deal with this duality between the this seemingly you know irreducible subjective level of where we yes. are feeling colors or whatever, yes, yes, and then the sort of material world. So in your models, it, it when, is material too in my mind. But anyway, go ahead. Absolutely, I no, I, I completely agree. I'm just trying to sort of think about that interface. Yeah, yeah. So in your model, there's no interface. It's the same thing. It's just right. that it's one. It's right. like two sides of the same coin. Right. Exactly. I really appreciate that way of putting the point. So it's at that it's at that level or, or that one that side of the coin where the qualitative the subjective qualitative uh, uh, properties emerge to the subject. Yeah. Um, is and is that that's hooked up with that policy in your view? That's where. That's where the, yeah, so, so the colors the become colors. So, so first of all, uh, that state is, is an attractor. So what does it mean? It means that it's one of the discrete choices you can make. You, you focus on the color, say red, right. and, and you can name it. But that state is much more than uh, what you express with words, of course. You, you have all kinds of emotional and you know, all kind of experience that go with that word that someone else may have a different one. And it's difficult to put it in word because it's such a high dimensional thing. Yeah, of course you could talk about one particular experience or you could talk about an emotion you had, you know, um, but it wouldn't be, it would never be the full thing because it's so rich. It's, it's, it's so rich because it's like your whole cortical state is, you know, billions of neurons. You can't describe it. 
Right, and in humans, the attention only has access to a very sort of thin set, one set of So, of, so the way I, I think sets. about this, well, it, it has access to uh, like a, a view of that. Uh, it, it can't see all the neurons, but 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 it, you know there are experiences that suggest that you can train your attention to focus on almost any piece of cortex, and you can connect any two pieces of cortex through attention. You can you can reason about two concepts that you never had put together very quickly. So um, yeah, it probably sees uh, at some uh, coarseness uh, everything that's going on. And uh, what it does in, 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 with this picture of a tractor is that it can steer things so that you will more likely go to one place or, the, or sort of sculpt the, this landscape so that uh, in, in some context, you will tend to go to uh, one thought and, 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 and with some probability, because there's also, okay, so I did talk about the stochastic aspect, which is also coherent with what we know from the neuroscience. So we know that, uh, cortical dynamics are in this, uh, standing in this near chaos region. And near chaos is very interesting because it's a place where you know, little perturbations can give rise to big changes, meaning you get to a different attractor. So, and there is a bit of noise as well in, in, at, at the low level in, 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 uh, in the brain. And so in a way, uh, th there's, there's a bit of randomness of which attractor you're gonna fall. And of course, the probability with which you will fall in one or the other is what this policy is sculpting so that you take the decisions that uh, in, in, in average give you the most bits. But at least that's my theory. Like I, I, don't, I don't claim it is the thing, obviously. Great, thank you. And you mentioned um, um, attention uh, schema theory. So you were re yes. del deliberately referencing, re referencing Graziano and some yes, of that yes, work. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's just a great talk. We, we better move on though. And um, I wanted to check in back at the physical center at the Gruber Sandbox. Um, I, saw, I saw a hand go up from, FAU Arts and Letters. <laughs> I don't know who that person is, but I'm assuming it's someone at the center who wants to ask a question. Okay, and there's another hand up. I'll go to the next one. Um, Daniel Von Zant. Hey there. Um, Hi. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. We can't awesome. see you, but we can hear you. Unfortunately, my camera isn't working. Um, but okay. that might be pretty nice. I got a face for radio. But I, um, I really enjoyed your talk. A lot of it uh, sits well with me in terms of understanding kind of the gap between machine learning and human consciousness. Um, and something I was thinking about is that as humans are building these kind of uh, factoring out these causal models of the way the world works and using it to infer things based on um, kind of the starting point, it seems that humans pay special attention to things that are outside of those causal models. So like as a culture, we're really excited about um, paranormal phenomena because that's outside of our causal models or in general, if you're driving down the road and you see someone driving the wrong way. And, and, and I guess my question is, is there a way or are there any projects um, that have worked on paying special attention to exceptions into uh, machine learning models? Yeah, that, that comes out sort of automatically of the sort of framework that uh, we're building because we have these probabilistic models implicitly, right? Um, the probabilities or the uh, what we call free energies, if you want, they're like scores that the brain may be computing. And there's evidence also from neuroscience that these kind of scores exist. So you should think of like surprise. Right? So there's a lot of evidence that things like these are computed in the brain. And, um, and so if you have something that violates your expectations, causal or otherwise, you get a really big jolt and you pay attention to it and, uh, and you try to find like what's wrong, like what's going on, uh, why? So yeah, I think it's all very coherent with uh, what I've been talking about. Awesome, Steven. thank you. I really enjoyed it, great. Thanks. Steven Gupka, do you have a question? Uh, we have a question from Garrett, who's sitting right next to me. Oh, hi, Garrett. I miss you guys. <laughs> hey, <what's up? laughs> For whatever reason, we can't get the microphone to work. So hopefully there's no reverb. Uh, but yeah, um, 
thank you for the talk. I, I was actually, I had a question uh, specifically, you had mentioned Judea Pearl's interventionist framework. I guess what I was wondering is in terms of like, <laughs> uh, in terms of coming up with a um, sort of either a causal analysis or trying to bake causation into the network, so to speak. I guess in some sense, what I was I asking you, what I want to ask is, do you think interventionist frameworks, say broadly construed, are the way to analyze like a, like a neural network in terms of what it does causally speaking or causal reasoning? Or do you think in some sense, baking that kind of um, causation into the network is the step forward? Um, if that makes any sense. <laughs> um, I, I thought the two alternatives are the same, but uh, maybe I missed something. Uh, let me try to answer anyways. Uh, yeah, so what we're working on, and, and I, I gave one paper, this UAI paper of the last August uh, from Deleuze et al, um, is uh, incorporating the, um, the causal aspects in, in the inference made by the neural net. So what the neural net is doing is sampling possible causal explanations um, with probability hopefully proportional to the correct thing, which is the Bayesian posterior. Um, and it's not like you need a special kind of neural net. It's just the way that they're trained and structured in these in this modular way. Uh, and there are many ways that you could you know envision how to do that, but this is the direction we're taking. Um, and now the interventions, they, it, it, the way that we are thinking about them is they are just special random variables. So normally you do inference about unknown quantities like you know uh, random variables. That's what presumably a lot of your thoughts are about. Um, and, uh, and in fact, a lot of the inference we're doing is like who did what, <laughs> right? To explain what we're seeing. And that's inference over intervention. Somebody did something. That is an intervention, right? That caused things to happen later. So um, the way I really uh, envision this mathematically is to think of the interventions as special variables that change, that do the, the thing mathematically that uh, Jude Pearl is talking about, like this surgery in, in the graphical um, uh, structure. Um, and um, yeah, I, I, I think you don't need like super fancy things in order to do that. I guess if I could, if I guess like a, a little further clarification, just in the sense of, I guess, um, you know, thinking of like someone like James Woodward's extension of Judea Pearl's interventionist framework. So he sort of spells out um, sort of a broader causal theory about interventionism. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering like, you know, is there difficulty in identifying clearly intervention variables in this type of method? So like, in the sense of, I mean, I'm not obviously read the paper, I haven't read it, so, but um, I'm just curious, I guess, um, so what the, that looks like, or is the, it just more the, of like looking for yeah, the preventers or these types of things? Um, is that the process? Oh, Maybe so, I misunderstand. So, so the, the paper that I mentioned is not about interventions. The paper that I mentioned is about how to do Bayesian posteriors over uh, random variables in uh, causal graphs. but. Um, the way I think about interventions, um, and, and I don't know that, that author you mentioned, but the way I think about it is um, it, it's related to a lot of the literature in reinforcement learning, where we're thinking about uh, you know, agency and goals. So goals drive policies, the, the, what, how we decide to do what. Um, and uh, goals are often related to specific things, entities in the world that we'd like to change. We want to maybe reach a position or we want to close a door. Or, and, and often if you notice the goals that we manipulate, they can be spelled out in a sentence or very few. Um, and so that, that strongly suggests that the, um, we're uh, constructing this, uh, these plans or these inferences or interpretations about interventions, like this person had the goal to close the door, and this is why I can't <laughs> go through it now. Well, I want to uh, ask a question. 
if I'm allowed, even though I'm the moderator. So Joshua, I, I love the paper. I love the body of work. Um, I know this sounds funny and maybe you won't believe this, but back in 2018, I published a book with MIT Press. And in the beginning of the book, it was called The Language of Thought. And it was an argument against Jerry Fodor because he was my supervisor. It's always great to offend your supervisor by writing a book. <laughs> That's yeah. But guess what I said? In the introduction, I said AI will succeed. And I talked about a similar project that I was really impressed with um, by Bernie Bars and Murray Shanahan using uh -huh. global space architecture. And that's why I was so excited to learn about what your lab is doing. Um, and so I guess there were a couple things I wanted to just kind of ask you about related to this general pro project. Okay, so the first thing, when you're talking about you know, looking at mechanisms of human consciousness to build a better form of AI, you're not yes. at all implying that the AI will have anything like what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness, that it would necessarily feel like anything from the inside to be the AI, right? Or, or are you? I don't imply anything. I suspect that we are on our way to develop uh, a mechanistic construction that we can put in machines and that will have all the properties of consciousness, including um, a subjective experience. I don't see any wow. reason why not. I oh, don't wow. believe okay, I don't believe in zombies, so I don't see why we couldn't. I mean, unless we self-destruct because we you're stupid about climate change and other politics. Yeah, I mean, eventually we could uh, build conscious AI. I guess that, you know, the thing that I, I'm not clear about is what we really need to build a uh, very smart artificial intelligence. Do we just need to roughly emulate um, the mechanisms that humans use when they're conscious to- No, we need to understand them. So a big part of what I'm doing, and I try to give a little bit of uh, a view on that today is that it's not about copying things we see uh, in human brains or human minds. It's about understanding the principles that may have, you know, uh, arose because of the evolutionary pressure, the advantage that they give us and understanding why they help, for example, to generalize better, which was what I started with because we want the same properties for our AI systems. We want them to generalize as well as humans and maybe better one day, but, but you know, I think a good starting point is let's see where the gap is and the principles that we may uh, uh, discover hopefully will help us both build better AI systems and understand human intelligence, including consciousness. But of course, you know, I don't know, this is, this is the, the I mean, story. I, it, it's difficult to tell. I mean, because we don't understand why we're conscious. I mean, there's the hard problem, but there's also just this sort of. No, but it's obvious why we're conscious. It's because it, it's obvious that we're conscious because it has evolutionary value. There's no other reason. Unless you believe in some supernatural things. Well, there would be evolutionary value to being sophisticated information processing devices without any kind of inner feel. I mean, I don't think, you know, being- No, but I just gave you, no, but I, I just gave you two examples of why this inner feel might arise as a side effect of the computation that are being done. So I gave two examples. So there's the one that Graziano talked about, talks about, and then he has a nice review from 2020, I think, which I encourage you to read. And um, there's the one that I've been talking about, about the duality of representations of states that have both the discrete nature as easy to express and a very ineffable high dimensional continuous nature that is almost impossible to express. And that is just, re you know, if, if this was what was going on in your brain, you would have the feeling that there's something missing in the words that you express about what's going on in your brain. Because that state influences everything. It influences your next thought, influences your actions. So it is a real thing. 
you don't have access to it verbally, but it is there and it's influencing what you're doing. So somehow that must be turned into some kind of sensation. Jennifer Nagel. Uh, hi. So uh, thank you so much for for the for the talk and uh, it's and yeah, I find your work very very interesting. Um, so since you brought up um, evolutionary advantages of consciousness, I'm curious about your attitude towards the sort of consciousness is for sharing view because it seems to me like you've got you've got a very um, sorry what is that i don't know what that is oh this is like the christopher frith kind of view so so the the idea is that um uh you know humans are the only animal that is epistemically cooperative there's lots of other animals oh, that, yeah 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 no, that's, that's so, that makes so, sense I, I, you know, and, so, and I so think, like uh, I, Graziano's yeah. view also has some, you know, the social aspect of, of consciousness. I didn't talk at all about it, but but it, yeah, it could be part of it. it right, it's not I, necessary. There's only one like explanation. It could be yeah, multiple yeah, factors yeah. that make consciousness a useful thing to have. But it's it's sort of interesting that those um, that these things go together with us um, as 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 a species, right? That yeah, you know, like yeah. our closest animal relatives are really very smart um, as individuals but they're not really um, yeah. putting putting their minds together and they can't because they, well, they chimps can't- Well, can, chimps can make war and they, that's very coordinated, but I, I agree yeah, that humans right, are right. much more dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and maybe it's because we have this, um, we have this coarsening of the state space, which allows us to use the very limited bottleneck of yeah and, and so there, there's um stand a hand brings up evidence that uh, there's some fundamental differences in the way that we reason and that like uh, chimps reason um that some sort of uh, ability to describe things at a, at a more abstract recursive level um you know so the, the, there's also like evidence of differences in uh, the way our hippocampus works um that that may be part of the story Okay, so so do you think that that would be any reason to look at something like multi-agent reinforcement learning as a sort sure. of special area for the emergence of consciousness? Yeah. Because you could have yeah. agents who are, for example, able to evaluate each other's epistemic states and take advantage of the fact that they're operating within a shared environment. Yeah, that, that's definitely an important uh, direction. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. I very, I very much enjoyed Thanks. your enjoyed your talk. I'm actually, I'm tempted to ask one more question. Am I? I don't know, Susan. What the we have time? time. Or, yeah. No. Go for it. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm also kind of curious about the situations under which we escalate from type one to type two cognition, right? That, um, you know, so unfamiliarity is going to be is going to be going to be one of these. Yeah. Um, so, so the way that I think these, about it. Uh, yeah. from an AI perspective is that because of the nature of the system two computation, um, it's a very limited resource. Obviously, if you focus on very few things, the, you have to be careful about what you choose. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's also inefficient. Like if you can go with your habitual way of driving, it's actually safer. I mean, in other words, if you're if you're driving in the usual route, you better like do it with the system one and start like overthink. <laughs> and then... Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be cognitively too taxing. But I was, I was just gonna say one of the things that switches us up is some kind of metacognitive monitoring. So when processing is yes um, slower than it's anticipated to be, and I'm yeah. wondering about the extent. And it seems like that's something that AI could very easily model. And I wonder about yeah. the extent to which. You're so if you if you start thinking that. about the this uh, conscious focus as a limited resource, you can put it in the reward function of the attention policy. So the attention policy doesn't just get reward in terms of like number of bits of information it's able to extract from the input, uh, but but also this is like number of bits per second of usage of this precious resource. And, and then you have something where sometimes you might say, oh, I better not use it. Um, and, um, and, 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 you know, if there's something dangerous going on, maybe you just go and flee and not start thinking about, oh, is it really a lion? <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. Um, but you could put into that, like there's some kind of intrinsic reward there for- Of course, um, of course. Yeah. yes, yes, there is. Okay, and and then could that like do you could that could that possibly have um, 
um, have a connection to the sort of um, the the social setting as well. That is, could it could it be that yeah that part of what we're looking for is to um, is to make judgments that will be received as informative by others? Could that be? Yeah, I haven't thought yeah. so much about the social aspects of things, but okay. I'm sure there are like okay. very strong yeah. inductive biases that um, make us get rewarded for a lot of the things we do uh, socially. I mean, we can feel mm -hmm. it, <laughs> especially, yeah, sure. af especially sure. after the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Even even on Zoom to some to some extent, yeah. Um, well, thank, thank you very much. Um, You're welcome. Enjoyed the talk. All right, I should probably go, well, but it was great talking to all of you. It was wonderful talking to you, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Bye-bye.